Welcome to Beyond the Bazaar, a podcast curated to all things, well, bizarre. My name is Brianna, and I will be sharing with you urban legends, lore, ghost stories, and more from around our planet. Hey everybody, welcome back to Beyond the Bazaar. I'm Brianna, your host, and I'm so glad you guys are joining me for another episode. I hope you all enjoyed last week's episode on the Paris Catacombs. We kind of went down a rabbit hole far with that and I really, really liked it. So I'm glad you guys um, are returning back and I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I want to let you know, um, because we were a little bit late posting the show notes. Um, If you haven't already, Check out the show notes from last week's episode on the Paris Catacombs on our website, www.beyondthebazaar.com. We have the show notes there, includes all the sources that we use for research. Also has the video that I was telling you all about last week of the lost man of the catacombs. We found that video. We linked that video there and we also have the video posted live on our website. So go ahead and check those out if you want to dig a little bit further about the Paris Catacombs, get a little bit more information. You're more than welcome to do that. Starting this episode tonight and every episode in the future, we will include show notes the day of the day that the episode is posted. We won't post it after. So we do know a lot of you, you know, want to know the resources and, you know, may want to view additional content like visual content, um, videos photographs, things that relate to whatever the topic is of the week. We want to ha- we're going to have that posted on the day of or at least as close to the day of that we can just to have that readily available since it took us a couple of days to get it up on our website for the Paris Catacombs and we do apologize for that, but it was our first episode so we're still trying to get into the groove of everything. Speaking of we, um, I know you guys are always wondering why You guys may be wondering why I say we. It's because Beyond the Bazaar is a two-person team. It's me, myself, Brianna, and my friend, Kazare. We run the podcast together. We produce content creators, moderators of our website and social media, Facebook. We do all of that. So I always like to say we to kind of encompass her in it. Because even though she's not hosting or speaking on the podcast as of right now I still you know just want to acknowledge her as you know we both do the research together you know compile everything together so I just want to kind of just encompass her by using we so it's a team effort and I love doing it so it's a great thing so speaking of we and episodes and things of that nature tonight's episode takes us to the southeastern region of the United States where there's a legend of a vampire-like creature that preys on the living in the Carolinas. This creature is known as the Buhag. The Buhag is a myth of the Golog Geechee people in the southern United States. Now, see, I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Before I even get into what I found out about it, it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Because I am from the United States, and I am from that, <laughs> I am from that region of the United States I was like ooh, but I I was kind of I was kind of like oh no you know but it got me it did it got me a little bit so I want to get into it you know tell you guys all about it but before we get into the myth of the boo hack I do want to give you guys a little bit of a background on the um, Gola Geechee people so the Gola Geechee people are descendants of enslaved Africans they worked on rice indigo and cotton plantations of the Atlantic coast in America. As of today, they currently primarily reside in a few states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So pretty much the states that are along, you know, the um, Southeastern United States, those four states. Now the Gola Geechee people do have their own language. It's the only, actually it's the only African Creole language in the United States, which I found very fascinating. Since I am African American, I thought that was really, really cool, and it was really nice to know because I did not know that. 
So that language, um, the African Creole language, is a mix of European and American languages. Now, that language has also influenced a lot of Southern vocabulary and speech patterns. And with me being from the South, Southern United States, that was very interesting for me to know because I... (laughs) I'm very much aware that I do have a bit of an accent, so <laughs> my accent could very well be be the result, you know, of their culture of the Gola language. So that was really cool for me to know. So if you want to like compare the have a comparison of the Gola Geechee um, language, since you I don't know if anyone out there knows someone of that lang um knows someone of that is Gola Geechee or someone who is Gola Geechee. Something you can compare it to, it's kind of identical to the Bohemian Creole language. And it's kind of similar to the Creole language in West Africa and the Creole language that's in the Caribbean. So if you hear that kind of language, that's kind of what the Gola Geechee, the Gola Geechee language sounds like. So that was kind of a nice comparison when I was researching that. It kind of gave me a general idea as to what, you know, having a conversation with someone of the Gola culture would sound like. So speaking of languages, the Gola Geechee people have preserved much of their African linguistic traditions and cultural traditions while also picking up on influences from the southeastern United States. So they still do their own, like have their own culture, traditions, like many people, you know, but they also adopted adopted traits and traditions from just being in America and how America changes so much. They've kind of adopted that I mean, indoctrine that as well. And that indoctrine also spills over into um, the beliefs of ghosts and spirits where a lot of people in America, especially in the South, have their beliefs about hags and haunts are similar to their African beliefs about malevolent ancestors, witches, and forest spirits. So their belief in the Buhag derives from, you know, their African African heritage, you know, about the ghost of malevolent ancestors that may return, evil witches, things like that. So that's where their belief on comes from and how the myth of the Buhag came to be. So for the Buhag, the Buhag myth, it originated in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, Although the Gola Geechee people do live in North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, the myth did originate in the both Carolina states. The myth of the Buhag can be linked to the Gola's belief that every person has both a soul and a spirit. The Gola believe that the soul, when someone dies, the soul will leave their body and ascend to heaven if that person was a good person on earth. They will view the spirit as being separate. So the soul is sent to heaven while the spirit remains behind and kind of it's kind of like guardian angel to their family. They'll stay behind, make sure that their family is safe, guide them and protect them when they're needed. So I thought that was very that was very good. And that kind of shows like, you know, how we have like the guardian angels, like a lot of religions have that where they have the, the good spirits that watch over them. So, of course, where there is any good, there has to be a bad to balance it. So that's just commonly known. So in regards to bad spirits, the Gola people believed that the bad spirits were boo hags and was still a person's energy and potentially their life force as they slept. This is why in South Carolina, instead of someone telling you good night, you may hear someone tell you, don't let the hag ride you. So pretty much, you know, don't let the boo hag attack you. Now, when I was doing some research before I get into what makes a boo hag a boo hag and how to spot one and how to get rid of one if you shall be haunted, haunted by them. I meant to say this at the beginning, but I do want to say it now before I get too far into it. I'm actually going to start putting this at the beginning of each episode. If anyone, if any of our listeners are under the age of 13, this may scare you. You may want to ask a parent or guardian before listening. Because I don't want to be responsible for anyone having nightmares or anything like that. So if you're under 13, this content, you know, may not be suitable for you. It's going to be kind of descriptive and, 
you know, maybe a little bit too scary. I just wanted to put that out there before I get into what a boohag looks like. So as for the characteristics of a boohag, they are similar to the vampire of European lore. But of course, you know, they don't drink blood. They actually steal the life force of their victims. So they drink in their life force in place of blood. So that's why a lot of the time they would be compared to the vampire of European folklore. As for the Buhag's appearance, they're skinless. So they kind of look like clumps of meat. They're red in appearance. Vein, they have blue veins that are bulging. They have clumps of matted hair on them and glowing eyes, talons on both their feet and hands. And, oh, goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> I made myself shudder a little bit. But yeah, they, that's, you know, they pretty much just look like a big mass of just meat with hair and eyes and talons. To blend in with the world, they go and they steal the skin from their victims. That's how they blend in and to keep people from, of course, spawning them. They would steal, once again, the skin of their victims or a living person's skin. They'll wear it pretty much like me and you put on clothes. That's how they wear skin. As a, but at night, um, the buhag will shed their skin to seek out their victims. During the day, a buhag without their skin will hide. Naturally hunched. That's their, they actually naturally hunch over. They don't stand upright. And they will pretty much stand and hide in dark places to check out potential victims. Now, if the buhag is out anywhere hiding somewhere dark and they spot a victim and spot something that they like, they can follow that victim home. When they follow him home, they wait behind doors, any dark space, and wait for the victim to fall asleep. Now, before, of course, hiding behind doors or anything like that, the buhag does have to actually enter the victim's um, space, their home or wherever they are. They do that by sneaking into the tiniest crack or small opening. So any opening in the window, any tiny crack, anything like that, they can just slip right on in. So they'll slip in, they'll find a dark hiding spot and wait until the victim falls asleep. Once the victim is asleep, they'll sit on their victim's chest and steal their life force, stealing their breath and taking in all their energy. They will remain and linger until dawn. And before dawn, they have to be back in their skin. If they're not back in their skin by dawn, then they'll be destroyed. Now, so I know that the next question I asked myself after reading all this, well, how would someone know if they were followed by a buhag? How would you know what, were, what are the signs? You know, how can you tell? Well, there are ways to know when a buhag is near you or if you have been visited by a buhag or being haunted by one. The air will become very hot and musty. It will become damp. It will actually smell like something is rotting. So if you smell like something is rotting and it's like very hot and musty, then it's probably a buhag is nearby. If you wake up in the morning and you feel utterly exhausted, even after sleeping all night. Now, I'm not saying like you go to bed at 3 and wake up at 6 and you're tired. That's normal. You just didn't get enough sleep. But if you go to sleep and you get your full 8 hours and you wake up as if you were only sleep from 3 to 6, then it may have been a boo hack or you just have really, really bad insomnia. That's one or the other. But mo let's just say it could be a boo hack. Um, Another way to know if you wake up after having a full night's sleep, as I said before, full eight hours, we had a great night's sleep. You wake up and you still feel utterly exhausted to the point where it's almost impossible for you to pull yourself out of bed. You don't know how you're going to go throughout the day. And you're walking around your home and you hear rumbling underneath your floor. Then that means there's a boo hag. So the next question is, what do you do if you should attract or you're being haunted by a boo hag so per the lore that i have researched one of the main remedies to get rid of a boo hag or to distract them from attacking you i should say is to buy a bristle broom those are the old-fashioned wooden handle brooms with the bristles at the end that 
most of us have probably seen when we were kids or our parents used or grandparents used. And you buy one of those with as many bristles as possible. You put that broom at the foot of your bed and then you go to sleep as normal. So per the conjurement or root doctors, whichever term you prefer, when the buhag arrives, it will not be able to resist the temptation of the broom. So what the buhag will do, it will actually pull the broom on its lap and it will start counting each individual bristle. So that's why I said it has to have as many bristles as possible. The more bristles, you know, the longer it will take the buhag to count each one. So the, even though the buhag's main focus ultimately is to attack their victim or, you know, and suck their breath or energy, that f- main focus distracts them from being able to count those bristles. So they'll have to keep starting over and starting over. And this distracts them from attacking you. If you have a broom with enough bristles, this will keep the buhag busy just before dawn. And then the buhag will leave to return to their skin. So in some versions of the myth, I also found, I guess probably in newer versions, if you don't have or can't find a bristle broom, then you can use a bristle brush. Like those wooden handle brushes with those bristles. Um, you can use that in place of, in place of a bristle broom to use and just put that at the foot of your bed as you would the bristle broom. Now, Laura does go on to say that the buhag can count fast. So to be on the safe side, along with the broom or the brush, whichever one that you would have, have a sieve or a strainer there as well. The buhag, along with the bristles on the brush or broom, will also be compelled to count the holes in the sieve or strainer. By the time they count all those bristles and count all the holes, it will either be before dawn when they have to return to their skin or you know they'll just keep counting and counting to the point where if dawn does approach then they'll be destroyed because they just spent the whole time counting but if for some reason that buhag finishes counting all the bristles and finish counting all the holes and still has time to attack and you should wake up in the middle of a buhag attack it will be hard i'm not going to the I don't want to think about it, but from what I've read from Conjurman and research, it's best not to fight them, even though once I said it will be hard, the first thing you want to do is fight. But the last thing you want to do is that because the next skin the Buhag wears may be your very own. So outside of the brooms and brushes and strainers, other ways to repel the buhag is to go outside and paint the top of your window, doorways, anything that leads outside to inside, paint the top of those in indigo blue. The color indigo is known to repel buhags and other evil spirits as well. And they will repel them and they won't be able to enter your home. Another repellent, which is salt or salt and pepper in some versions of the myth. So a buhag that has been salted cannot get back into their skin. However, it can prove difficult to salt a buhag. As one, you have to be sure that the individual you deem suspicious is actually a buhag wearing skin. Or two, you manage to salt a buhag's abandoned skin. So if you manage to salt a buhag's abandoned skin, that prevents them from being able to put the skin back on. As I previously stated, if a buhag is not able to get their skin back on by dawn, then they're effectively destroyed because they're just walking around in their raw form. So if you plan on salting a buhag's abandoned skin, then of course you will have to be awake to salt the skin. And being awake around a buhag could prove dangerous for you. Doing all this research on the buhag as I stated before it did it did kind of creep me out a little bit but at the same time I found it very interesting one thing I found interesting is that they're on the buhag is compared to vampires in the essence that they drain the energy of life force from their victims similar to where a vampire drains their victim's blood but also the use of salt is kind of reminiscent of witches. Like, you know, you make a circle of salt around the house, a line of salt in front of the door. That's kind of reminiscent of witches, the lore of witches. So I'm just like, is a buhag more so a witch? A vampire is like a little mix of both. So that's why I was kind of just like, 
things to make you go, hmm, on that one. Because it just kind of, I guess because the way my mind works, I'm just kind of pondering as to is it either or, like, you know, what is it more derivative of. And I did try to do some research, and most research did compare it more so to vampires. So I would say that that probably does make more sense for it to be vampires. And in fact, the vampires are known to use their looks Whereas boo hags will wear the skin of their victim to kind of blend in. Vampires use their looks to kind of blend in and to seduce their victims. So I guess they are similar in that aspect. During my research, I did run across a story that has actually passed through the Carolinas. The story is of a man who one day suspects that he has married a boo hag. Now, I can't think of anything more terrifying than realize you've married an actual monster and not some metaphorical one, but you've married an actual monster. So I did come across that story that I found interesting, and I want to share it with you all. So here it goes. Two men who have been friends all of their lives. Let's call them Alan and Joel. Both Alan and Joel got married to beautiful women and all seemed to be happily ever after. Let's call Alan's wife Nedra and Joel's wife Bianca. Both Joel and Alan married their wives Nedra and Bianca and all was blissful. But one day, Alan visited Joel and asked him a peculiar question. When you wake up, is Bianca there with you? Joel, perplexed, answered, she is. Why do you ask? Alan, with slight concern, explained to Joel. When I go to sleep at night, Nedra is there with me. But when I wake up in the middle of the night, she's gone but I find her back beside me in the morning. Joel looks puzzled for a moment, but soon his eyes grow wide. Alan, she could be a boo hag. Alan felt his heart plummet to his stomach. He knew all about boo hags and how serious this was. From his knowledge passed to him from his grandma, a boo hag is a kind of witch or vampire. An evil creature that sucks the life straight out of unsuspecting, vulnerable men. Alan, breaking into a cold sweat, asked his best friend Joel what he should do. Joel got closer to Alan and told him to wait until Nedra slips out of her skin again. Once she is out of her skin, take salt and pepper and smear plenty of it all over the skin. That way, she won't be able to enter her skin or get her skin back on. Alan nodded and went home with a heavy mind. It's his wife or his life. That night, Alan pretended to sleep as Nedra laid next to him. Shortly after midnight, he felt Nedra, no, the boo hag, slip out of the bed. Once he heard that she was downstairs, Alan hid where she could not see him, but he could see her. Much to Alan's horror, his wife began pulling off her skin. She really was a boo hag. Alan watched as she pulled off her skin, rolled it up, and stored it underneath the stairs. Alan shuddered at the massive red blob in front of him that he once loved as his wife, his loving Nedra. Before he could completely register what exactly was happening, the boo hag flown up the chimney and out into the world to seek out her victims. Once Alan was able to will himself to move, he went and grabbed the skin. He took the salt and pepper and covered the entire mass with it, managing to keep his dinner down in the process. Once the skin was completely covered, he went back up to bed and tucked the covers up to his neck. Alan laid there until almost early morning, just before dawn, and heard the boo hag come down, back down the chimney. His body tensed as he heard her speak. It was still Nedra's voice. She spoke softly. Skin, you know me. 
Skin, this is me. Skin, you know me. Skin, this is me. Alan heard his heartbeat in his ears as he knew that with the skin cover and all that salt and pepper, the hag could not return to her skin. He continued to lay there quietly as Nedra's voice whispered softly again. Skin, skin, you know me. Skin, skin, this is me. With that, Alan knew that the hag was stuck without her skin. He almost felt relief until he heard his boo hag of a wife come up the steps. At once, Alan squeezed his eyes shut and pretended to be asleep. He felt her crawl into bed beside him and wrap herself tightly in the sheet. With all the courage he could muster, Alan reached over and felt her. The texture warm and raw feeling, similar to warm rubber. He recoiled his arm and waited for a response from Nedra. She said nothing. Alan laid there all night, unable and unwilling to let sleep overtake him. When daylight broke, Alan got up out of bed and turned to his wife Nedra, still bundled in the sheet. Nedra, come on, get up. We're supposed to meet Joel and Bianca for breakfast this morning. Nedra spoke back to him. You go. I'm not feeling well. I think I may be sick. Alan leered at the thing that deceived him, covered from head to toe in the sheet, now uh, not allowing one inch of herself to show. I can call Dr. Busby. He can check you out. Alan choked out, knowing what he had planned. Nedra told him that house calls are too expensive and insisted that he go have breakfast without her. Ellen went downstairs and grabbed his jacket and prepared to go meet Joel. Once outside, Alan heard his wife call out, Skin, skin, you know me. Skin, skin, this is me. With that, Alan sprinted to Joel's and was met with his best friend and an elderly man. This was part of the plan that Joel had laid out. Joel explained to Alan that the elderly man was a local root doctor or conjurer. Let's call this root doctor Papa Shama. Papa Shama would help them get rid of the boo hag once and for all. Alan explained the events to Papa Shama and the old man told him to go home and build a fire in his garden, a barrel fire. Once you've done that, I will help you take care of the rest, Papa Shama said. Alan rushed home and did what he was told by Papa Shama. Once the barrel fire was ignited, Papa Shama walked up to Alan's house and they both went inside to face the monster. Inside the bedroom, Nedra was still wrapped tightly in the sheet. Papa Shama, in a strong voice, surprising to Alan due to the old man's small size, said, What ails you, woman? There was silence. Then Edra answered, nothing. Papa Shama furrowed his brow and lunged for the sheet, yanking it off. Alan fell against the wall, clutching his chest. There laid a bloody, raw mass. His eyes unwillingly met the glowing eyes of the boohag, then traveled to her taloned hands and matted hair. This thing, once, was his beautiful wife. Alan stopped himself. Nedra was never his. She was always this thing. Alan finally snapped back to reality and heard Papa Shama say, Boy, you really done married a boo hag, eh? Alan was speechless. Papa Shama turned back to the bloody mass and said to Alan, Let's go do what we came here to do. They picked up the boo hag and carried her out to the garden to the burning barrel. Alan and Papa Shama threw the boohag into the barrel, burning her alive. Alan felt a sting in his eyes and could not tell if it was the smell of the burning monster or his tears. He turned to Papa Shama and Papa Shama turned back as if he knew what Alan was going to ask and said, There's nothing else we could have done, son. Count yourself lucky. Not many men have a boohag for a wife and escape with their life. Whew. This story was very interesting to me. 
unfortunately, I couldn't exactly pinpoint um, the origin of the story, like who was the first to tell it. I think it's more of those like lore would they kind of just get lost through time, but it's always told. I think it's just one of those stories. But it is one of the most interesting stories that I was able to find associated with the Buhag myth. The shell of the story is pretty much he tells the man of his suspicions as to what's going on with his wife and his best friend states that you may have married a Buhag. So he goes to the local conjure man and the local conjure man comes up to the house and they get rid of the boo hag. So that's kind of the standard shell of the story. I just kind of added some stuffing in there with names and just to make it more personable. So I do hope you all enjoyed the telling of that. With the man in the story, the one thing that kind of stood out to me is the fact that he was able to set vows aside from someone that he had loved. I mean, that he had cherished as his wife. He was automatically able to just snap and be like, okay, this is a boo hag. I no longer have feelings. I want her dead. You know, that was really like a whoa moment for me. But another thing that I kind of found myself asking was, was Nedra always a boo hag the entire time? Because at the start of the story, it kind of gives the notion that with Alan, he just noticed that this was a trend of hers, so maybe Nedra could have been a victim. She may not have been a boo hag the entire time. Maybe she was just attacked and the boo hag began wearing her skin at some point. Another thing that I found really kind of funny, actually, is that the best friend, Joel and Ari Telling, automatically jumped to, bro, she's a boo hag. Most people would have been like, maybe she's having an affair. Maybe she's sneaking out, talking to somebody on the phone. Maybe something like that is going on. But the first thing that popped out of Joel's mouth is you've married a monster. Like she's a monster. You got to get out. So with that, I, <laughs> I found that very funny. And I like Joel's character. And Joel's cool. He can sit with us any day. On that note, with the end of our story, that concludes the second episode of Beyond the Bazaar. I do want to thank you all for tuning in another week. Um, if you do want, if you guys do want other stories on the Buhek mythology, we we're going to include all this information. I'm going to also include a copy of the story as well that I have, as well as other resources on our website www.beyondthebazaar.com. So go on the website, check it out. The story will have other links there. I mean, don't forget to come back next Tuesday for more unusual frights with a brand new episode. Until then, stay bizarre and don't let the hag ride you.